Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us to the Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series. My name is Candace Hawes, and we're really welcome to have with you with us today. The Pharmacy Cannabis Lecture Series is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. I want to thank all of our viewers and all of our customers from Bud and Bloom, from the Pottery, and from the Pharmacy Santa Barbara in Berkeley for joining us today. We have a really fun and interactive webinar for you guys today um, on interpreting. Interpreting is the art and science of the cannabis sommelier. And today we're gonna to learn the basics of how to evaluate cannabis flower to determine the quality, the variety type designation, psychotropic effects through the physical and aromatic inspection. Interpreting is really gonna help you identify unlabeled, uh, un unlabeled terpenes and products that are safe to consume. Now a little bit about our special guest speaker today. Max Montrose was born in Denver, Colorado, and from an early age, he was a cannabis educator. He founded the Tricome Institute in 2014. Since then, he's published three textbooks about the truths and complexities of the cannabis products and plants while developing the cannabis interpreting program, the Sommelier. Exactly. <laughs> and it's a wonderful book. I had a chance to read it and it has a lot of great information. He also has really cool tools that go along with that as well. So definitely check this out. Um, so the Tricome Institute is recognized and is a government certified in producing some of the most unique and qualified cannabis courses and certifications in the industry. Max is also involved with many cannabis research projects pertaining to new trichome types and interpreting mapping, which is really exciting. So I'm excited to have Matt with us or Max with us today um, to explain interpreting, how to do it, what benefits it brings. And so thank you very much for being with us today. Hey, thanks so much. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. And um, I really appreciate this type of platform where it's less lecture and more Q&A um, because uh, as you know, because you've checked out the book, um, interpreting is a complex art and science. Uh, mm -hmm. It has some controversy around it. Um, there's always new things being updated within interpreting um, our understanding of cannabis, the plant science research. So um, I'm kind of just excited to just answer people's questions about interpreting uh, more than just sit here and try to lecture at you and, and, and teach you everything about it. Um, and so um, I see a bunch of <laughs> things in the chat blowing up already. So I don't know if you want to I'm going to not look at the chat canvas so that mm -hmm. I'm going to focus here. I'm going to let <laughs> you do that. But um, if there's any burning desires, um, you can actually, let me, let me just give a quick intro on interpreting. Yeah, tell us about how you got in the industry, why cannabis was your chosen career path, and then tell us a little bit about the Tr Tricom Institute. Sure, and I'll, I'll make this part super brief. Um, I, uh, I was a legit medical patient when I was quite young, and I was self-medicating really without realizing it. Uh, and cannabis actually taught me how to uh, move away from pharmaceuticals. Um, it became a passion of mine. I became an activist, born and raised in Denver, Colorado, working on policy, legislation, activism, um, just led me to just go deeper and deeper into my passion for this plant and helping people better understand it. Um, what started the Tricome Institute was just my astonishment and frustration that when I was trying to help patients in the dispensary, I was told not to. <laughs> I was told to, um, you know, just sell them a sack of weed and move on. And there were there were people that I really wanted to make sure that they were getting what they needed. Um, and so I started teaching interpreting um, to my patients as early as 2008, 2009, um, and as it was just kind of continuing to grow and explore. Um, and then with just the unbelievable amount of misinformation in the industry that everyone else is conveying to patients. It's like, well, we have a big problem here from, from the top down. I don't think the industry respects the fact that bud tenders are the spearhead of the multi-billion dollar industry. Every, every, every transaction goes through their hands. Um, and so bud tenders need to know uh, what these products are and how to help people with them. Yeah, uh, We find that to be logical and just kind of like, you know, if, if you have to be trained, licensed and certified to paint fingernails and cut hair, if it requires an extra year of licensure to be able to legally shave someone's face as a barber, um, why do we have, uh, you know, 
upwards of 100,000 bud tenders US wide who for the most part are not trained or certified. Um, and, and then a lot of the ones who are trained and certified are trained more in how their dispensary functions, how the business works and how to do that well. And they're less trained in what cannabinoids are, how those things interact with terpenes, why you might not want to recommend a narrow leaf type to someone who just told you they have PTSD. Um, teaching uh, parents that CBD is psychoactive, but it's not intoxicating. Um, and transdermal patches are great for kids, uh, you know, with epilepsy, they don't have to smoke anything, vape anything, and it's not an edible. So, you know, bud tenders should know this kind of stuff. Um, and so I've been passionate about, you know, how do you, how do you uh, figure out what is misinformation? How do you determine that that is misinformation? And then what do you do about it? So the inception of Tricone was really, um, you know, education that's proper in the space. And then interpreting, it is designed off the, the principle and ideology of what someone yay is and means, especially to wine experts, uh, similar to beer cicerones, coffee cuppers, cheese mongers, tobaccoists. Um, you know, I always just find it fascinating that whenever I find cannabis experts, um, in the, in the cannabis industry, usually they don't know very much about the plant cannabis from a technical perspective. And that even includes some of like the, the heroes that wrote some of the old school grow books that kind of started this whole thing off. Um, and so it's amazing that this industry is as, uh, as wild as it is, and especially from an information perspective. And so it's always interesting, that, that's for sure. Um, and, and interpreting is an ability to help people weed better by going about the process of what cannabis is and means in an entirely different way. No more strain names, uh, no more indica or sativa. Uh, your lab test doesn't tell you half as much as it probably should. And believe it or not, you, your human self can actually understand cannabis at such a high level that when you approach cannabis um, from an interpreting perspective within that methodology, you can uh, you know, assure yourself that you know what you're getting from a quality perspective. To us, there's only two things that matter when you buy cannabis and they're really simple. Um, you're doing it, it's a drug, um, that's not bad. Uh, you pick up your prescription from the drugstore, even though it's a medicine, these are interchangeable. Um, and when you do a drug, you just want to know, hey, before I put this in my body, before I, I consume this, is it safe? Um, and, and safe at what level, right? And, and so, and then when I do consume it, what's going to happen to me? Those are the things that we find to be just the most important. <laughs> and uh, that information is, is not provided uh, in a lab test, in a COA. You don't know what the potency is because THC is not an equation of potency. Uh, they don't give you a psychotropic direction, whether it's stimulating or sedative or where in between those points. Um, and they won't even tell you if your cannabis was harvested ripe or if it was flushed properly, if it was grown in a way that needs flushing. Um, you can find cannabis, in, I can find cannabis that sold to me as a medical patient in the most highly regulated industry state today, Colorado, uh, cannabis that's a year old uh, and covered in spider mites. And it's because uh, they don't test for things like that. Um, and so interpreting is really a, uh, an intellectual solution to cannabis in, the cannabis industry's biggest problems. Uh, I hope that wasn't too much <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a ramble, but uh, that's, that's, that's basically what interpreting has going on. Great. Yeah, that, you made some really good points there. You know, unfortunately, there is no standard training for dispensary workers, you know, and dispensary workers are, um, they have to perform a lot of functions. You know, they're salespeople. A lot of time they're, um, they have this uh, therapist kind of role and they're like pharma, pharma, pharmacologists. It's just crazy what they're, you know, expected to, to do like on the spot with like hundreds of customers a day. So it really is important that people as well educate themselves. Like you said, a lot of the information that they need to make a good product choice isn't necessarily listed on the label. So I think that's really great that you, what you're doing. Um, so do you want to jump into some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. 
Um, so somebody's saying, how does aging, all the other factors equal, affect the quality of different cannabis strains? Does the polymerization of that that's being discussed in the aging of hash also, also affect aged cannabis flower? So <clears throat> aged cannabis, um, I think there could be a fine line between aged and old, because I think um, aged cannabis is a goal. Yeah. Right? Because the second you cut your cannabis plant down, the second you kill it, it uh, four hours after you, not the second, four hours after you cut it uh, is when it starts receiving uh, the chemical death of necrosis. <laughs> and, um, and right when necrosis starts is that's, that's when you start the, the terpene countdown time, the timer, because your terpenes are right. Like you can smell the plant that's, you know, a few feet away from you. Well, how are you connected to that thing that's, that you're not touching? There's a chemical chain that is connecting you two together. You're smelling that plant. And that wouldn't be possible without that chain leaving the plant's body. There has to be a trail for it to connect with you. And, um, and so you have a, your living hydrocarbon chains are in a constant state of evaporation. Your terpenes, it's not just what smells good, but it's what is adding to the potency of the flower, but also the effect type of the flower. So how would aging uh, affect those things? Well, um, we actually sell a product to assist people with aging their cannabis, uh, two products. One is a, a two-way humidity pack to keep your trichomes uh, moist at the proper moisture point so that they don't dry out. When your trichomes dry out, which is oxidization, the glandular aspect of them, their, their heads and their bodies literally crack. <laughs> they become dry and brittle and they crack open and that will release the remainder amount of the terpene types. Um, and so the goal is preservation. And so we have a jar uh, that uh, has been tested on cannabis specifically to retain uh, terpene retention, um, as well as uh, mixing that with a humidity pack. These are things we sell on our website, trichominstitute.com to assist in the aging process so that when you get high quality cannabis, it hopefully stays high quality cannabis longer than not. Yeah. Um, so I think aging is a goal. Um, and then there's weed that's just old. Yeah. You, can, you can pass the point of a proper cure and, and then you have old weed and old weed sucks. <laughs> um, in fact, on my little interpreting loop, this is how this the front page is how you gauge your effect type. Your second page is your unacceptable visual and odor characteristics. And under unacceptable odor characteristics, down here we have old flower listed, acrid, stale, dry hair with a hint of urine. Yes, old <laughs> cannabis has just a little tinge of human urine, like you're almost smelling it from down the hall. <laughs> it, so old weed is gross, you know, and it's gross because it being old means it's no longer green, it's brown. The oxidization process has now degraded chlorophyll. And if your chlorophyll's gone, your terpenes are out the window. See you later. What's left over? The THC, because it's super stable, except for the micro amount of it that broke down into CBN. And then the rest of it is just kind of like a, a piece of hay that smells crappy because it's old stale weed. So old weed sucks. <laughs> and um, I'm amazed that the industry doesn't have a, a like a shelf life timeline for flour or flour based products like pre rolls. Because man, oh man, have I gone into dispensaries and I look at the harvest date and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This was harvested a year ago. Why are you selling this? <laughs> it's like, that is like, that's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. So, um, so yeah, that's how I, I would say age affects it. And, um, and hash is different. And we're not going to get into hash right now because interpreting is flower specific for now. So I think we'll just, we'll stick with flower. Very good. That was a great answer. Thank you. Sure. Um, some, somebody's also asking here about um, if you can define the boundaries for the terrier, terriers, and if you could talk about the Appalachians. Um, <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so in, in uh, the, the English pronounce, pronunciation is terroir. Terroir. Or terroir. And that's that's awful. If, if you can, try to say it like a Frenchman. Okay. Um, terroir. <laughs> uh, terroir. Yeah, so, uh, so the terroir. And the terroir, cannabis terroir right now has, has controversy. And I'm the one who's bringing it. So if you want to talk about that, we can go there. Um, <laughs> uh, but is there... Is there something specific or do you want me to give just kind of a, a general premises on what is a cannabis appellation, what is cannabis tewa, and, and thus what would cannabis typicity mean? Yeah, I th yeah, he's asking about the boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. he's, this, uh, this viewer actually lives in French po Polynesia, so that's why he's asking. Well, if he lives in French Polynesia, can you ask him if my pronunciation is... <laughs> because <laughs> he would he would know you have um, a bunch of thumbs ups in the comments so. <laughs> thank you <Okay. laughs> it's on uh, point they're saying <laughs> thank you all right so um all right so appellation is is one of the coolest things ever right so think about real quick think about uh telling a cop to piss off because he's out of his jurisdiction right mm -hmm. right like authority only exists in certain geographies you can't have authority around the world Unless you're the United States of America and during the Controlled Substance Act, you decided to make drugs against the law for everyone around the world, which happened. Thanks, <laughs> Nixon. Um, but also, but uh, that, that would be a negative. A positive would be um, the, appella the, how, the appellations, how, how that works is really incredible. So just imagine the fact that France is literally the reason why every sparkling white grape grower in California cannot call their product champagne. And it's due to the legislation, the lawfulness of the geographies that have Appalachian status, which is legislative. And so um, in the world of cannabis, and by the way, wine Appalachians um, go as far back as the Torah. Um, and so which wines have to be grown in which geographies for specific purposes and reasons is, is a big element to what Appalachian means. So, and what it does is it preserves the heritage of Champagne. So mm -hmm. if your Champagne is going to be the real deal, it needs to come from Champagne, France. And, and, and so we just, uh, it's just this year, uh, actually, I think just last year, September, um, Governor Newsom of California just signed the world's very first cannabis appellation ever. And, and not the appellation, but the legislation that allows the state of California to section out the different geographies. And so you would go to the region of the Emerald Triangle, and then you would section out different areas of the Emerald Triangle for particular appellation statuses. I'm not going to get too deep into the science of, of how this works because this is a four hour presentation on, on how you do this. Um, but it's in California and they're building them right now. Um, okay, but imagine the within Champagne, France, which is lawful and is forcing all of the California growers to call their product brute <laughs> um, in, in exchange for Champagne. Uh, which is a big deal. I mean, that, that does affect sales, right? Um, within that appellation of Champagne, not the entire geography of Champagne, France has the same uh, climate or uh, microclimate or even ecosystem. Um, some of the different regions can be very drastically different uh, within the same appellation. And that's when you get into Tawa. Um, I'm not going to go super deep into terroir either. Let's just say that terroir, especially for wine, and this is where this gets controversial for cannabis, but for wine, you can taste the typicity. What is of typical that you taste from this specific climate? And so there are some, some onniers who are fully trained and educated who can tell you this wine is special because of this minute element it has going on for it, which 
tells you that it comes from this one area, which has been focusing on this varietal for, you know, 25 generations. This is the good stuff. <laughs> that, that's kind of what it means. Um, and so uh, I, I'll leave it at, I'll leave it, that, no, I'll, I'll say what the controversy is before I'll get off Tawa. The controversy is lots of people that even I respect in the cannabis industry due to their information, their flowers that they produce, um, their OG status, their Emerald Triangle <laughs> people, you know, for years, uh, including scientists. Um, uh, there's a large group of people that believe that uh, cannabis terroir is essentially the same as wine. And if that were true, that would mean that you could taste that this blue dream came from Humboldt, California, not Bend, Oregon. Way that a sommelier can taste that a Russian river, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, came from the Russian river Sonoma and nowhere else in the world because only the Russian river produces a microclimate that affects the typicity of the wine where that terroir can be expressed. And you can, you can note that. Um, it's really interesting stuff. <laughs> the, where, where the controversy is, I just want someone to, to demonstrate it to me one time or explain the science behind it that makes no sense, such as, I know cannabis is a bioaccumulator. I know cannabis is a bioremediator. I, and I know how those things work, but does the word bioaccumulation translate to accumulating the multiplicity flavor elements of the trees, the soils, the mineral, the moisture in the air and reabsorbed through the plant, distributed through different parts of its body. And then I guess that flavor would grow through a trichome head to be expressed, but trichomes only grow flavor compounds based on the terpenes that they're genetically designed to, not necessarily a, a transportation element from, from nature back in, through the cannabis. So it's like, it's a really interesting idea and I know that you could taste herbs that have been dry farmed because they're dry farmed. You taste earth in them. Yeah. But is that earth that you taste geographically specific the way that tewa needs to be? I have not seen that one time in cannabis. It sounds really cool, but where in the world has that like happened in actuality? Yeah, that's a really good point. And no one's really explained it that way, but that is completely true. I mean, uh, there, you can't really tell the difference in the taste. Some people will argue that the quality is different, you know, based on where you're growing it, but the taste, the end result, you know, is not distinguishable. That's, that's a really good point. I'm glad that you were, that you, that you discussed that. Um, all why we need more education and you need continued education, the cannabis industry and what we know is always evolving. So um, that's great. Um, we have a couple of questions, people asking about like how they can tell, like if their buds have like PGRs and stuff. So can you talk about how you can tell if your flower um, from like visual and an, an aromatic quality, if it's safe to consume and like what, what people should look for? Yeah. So going back to my little loop tool here, and by the way, for everyone who doesn't know, it's, it's, it's more than just, uh, gauging the effect of cannabis um, and their negative qualities, but also their uh, positive qualities, the main terpene types and their psychopharmacy and what those trans back to and, and back again, which, which is why it's called the loop. Um, but you know, in the, in the, on the loop and furthermore in the textbook, we have so many pages of information on what bad weed is. This is what you don't get in grow books. And most coffee table books are, is weed porn, like <laughs> colored buds, big book of buds, growers Bible. It's right. It's like, it's like a high times front covered, like dream session, every page. And let's get real. Not all cannabis works that way. Even the guys who have grown for 30 years can't help an infestation that happens over here or uh, my, my or, or fungus spores that comes from his neighbor that doesn't take good care of his plants. I mean, that's the truth about cannabis um, is sometimes there's shitty flower out there. 
<laughs> and so, you know, how do you know what good weed is if you don't know what bad weed is? And so we, we cover, God, I love these pages. We show you um, like really up close, you can see the spider mites in this really lovely herb. I mean, I would smoke that. If I didn't look at that with a jeweler's loop first, you would never see adult spider mites, baby spider mites, their webs, their fecal matter, and my favorite, their exoskeletons. And somebody did ask too, what, what happens if you do smoke bugs? Oh, well, well bad. You, yeah, well, well, you smoking bugs is something that you need to determine for yourself if it's bad. Um, from a qualitative perspective, I think it's fair to say that's bad. From a cheeky perspective, I think it's fair to say it's probably just a little extra protein <laughs> and it might not kill you. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'd rather smoke an, a, a bug or two than um, a pesticide or a fungus, yeah. you know, so I'd rather smoke a bug than smoke a pesticide. So anyway, so the book, the course, I mean, we go really in depth into uh, what, what qualitative cannabis is and means. On this loop, faulty structure uh, from form, color, the shape is off. And like we, we educate, like we, we show you faulty structure um, and what faulty structure looks like. I mean, it's cannabis that doesn't really hold itself up um, mm -hmm. structurally due to how poor its health is. Um, the trim, different colors, uh, pistillation, uh, hermaphroditic genetics, fungus types, um, and even trichomes, like trichomes that are damaged or that are entirely clear or that are a majority amber. Um, when it comes from smells, uh, unattractive smells, mold, sulfur, uh, unattractive perfumes, that's when, you know, people are doing sulfur burnings in flour when they shouldn't be. You can taste that. Um, nutrient lock, improper flush, old flour, or no pungency at all. That would be um, poor on the qualitative uh, section uh, from a cannabis flower perspective. So, um, there, I mean, you could go so in depth on any of those topics. Uh, I think the important thing is, is between the, the book, the wheels, the tools, the course, and even our social media, we constantly share um, tidbits all day on, on qualitative cannabis. Um, if there's anything hyper-specific I can answer, uh, you know, do yeah. let me know. Is there any way to tell just by looking at cannabis if it's been flushed properly or well enough? Yes. So if your um, cannabis has not been flushed properly, it will smell like salt. Mm -hmm. um, and generally that's because it's the salts from nutrients that are salt based that easily get stuck kind of in the plants, almost arteries, if you will. Uh, I mean, it's they're heavy salt bases. Um, and if that's not flushed out of the, really it's, it's the medium that you flush. You don't flush the plant, you flush the medium so that all of those residual salts that its roots are soaking in doesn't continue to soak up harsher and harsher salts that it's, it's remaining in before you, you know, cut it down. Um, so if you smell a jar of flour and it doesn't smell like that, um, pinpointed peppery smell that cannabis produces beta caryophylline then if it's salty then it, it's probably um uh it's probably not flush or it probably needs to be flushed better uh, we have another question here about ripeness um so is ripeness in cannabis the same as like ripeness of a banana they're asking do you correlate uh, ripeness to the effect that you're going to experience as well um we don't correlate ripeness to the effect that you'll be experiencing per se. Um, but when they asked like, is ripeness like a banana? Yes, I mean, a green banana is uh, pre-ripe, pre premature. A yellow banana is mature and a brown banana is, is post-mature. And I think when it comes to anything that's alive, including you and me, we have a ripening point. <laughs> <in our life. laughs> there, is, there is a point at which you are starting out and then you're at your peak. And then when you are done being at your peak, I hate to break it to living organisms, but you do decline. Um, and so uh, it's a, what it is, is it's, it's a climactic point of ripening. And so you have, you can, see your trichomes are 
not as mature because all of the clarity in the glandular heads, you're visually being able to see the lack of chemistry, cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids that are going to start building up over the next few weeks. Um, and then you can see that fogging happen in the cannabis. You can see ripening taking place. And you know that you're at your ripest point, at your climactic point, when, you know, hopefully 95% of your glandular trichomes are milky and the, uh, you're, there's just a couple amber. And when you see just a few amber, you know you've just tipped over that peak. And that's how you know you're right at that top. And so um, the thing that's interesting that I'll, I'll comment on about ripening and the cannabis industry is uh, take Colorado, for example. And I know to you Californians out there, this will, and for all of you environmentalists, this will be painful to hear. Uh, <laughs> uh, legislatively, we're not allowed to grow cannabis outdoors. Um, so, uh, there's only one County in Colorado that, that can grows out that, that can and does grow outdoors. And so we have just this megalithic footprint of unnecessary <laughs> light bulbs, uh, growing our plants when we have some pretty excellent sun, uh, being a, a mile high. Uh, anyways, the point is, is everything's grown indoors and it's really hard to find grow operations that uh, only grow one type. Most grows grow 20 strains, 30 strains, 60 strains, 180 strains in a single operation. The, the point is, is culturally in our industry, uh, in the in the back room in the grow and typically in indoors and in warehouses when the broadleaf types are done which generally happens around week eight the entire room comes down which generally includes a lot of the nlms the narrow leaf types um, and we know that narrow leaf types from a ripening perspective take anywhere between you know, one to even upwards to six weeks longer than BLM types. It's not uncommon for NLM varieties to generally finish at around week 10 instead of week eight. And so if you are proficient with your interpreting methodology, you should be able to visually see the inflorescence of flowers in jars. You should be able to visually see when they're more spacious, because there's more space between the bract, the bracting, um, what a lot of people call it calyx. The calyx is actually inside that bract area. Um, and if you see uh, wispy open spacious flower types that have longer uh, style and stigma pistols, um, that are generally more robust. It has more of them on that flower. You're, you're looking at a, at, a, at a stimulating herb, uh, which you'll probably feel um, in, in a certain part of your trigeminal nerve, most likely your alphalmic bulb. Um, and uh, it's not uncommon to buy sativas <laughs> in Denver, Colorado, narrow leaf types, and if you break out your jeweler's loop, um, very quickly look at your flower and in seconds, you can see that the majority of the trichomes are clear. Um, and so it's, it's not uncommon to investigate sativa types from Colorado grown indoors in this industry where the vast majority of them are premature. And so that cuts down on the terpene and cannabinoid potential dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a math number for you, but let's just say each week that could have gone by would have increased its chemistry um, probably, probably quite a bit. It's probably not minimal. It's probably, a, 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 it's probably a pretty dramatic, uh, depending on the degree of, of separation from when you cut it down and when you should have cut it down. So um, ripening definitely matters. Yeah. And, you know, growing is only part of the process. A lot of people put all their energy and emphasis on the growing part, but it's really 
the, the choosing the right time to pick the cannabis and the curing process that I think is very, you know, very important to determine the end, end product that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another good question that we have is, um, is interpreting uh, cannabinoid specific? No. <laughs> No, interpreting is not cannabinoid specific. Um, and the reason why is because interpreting is an art and science for you and your human self to be able to take care of your own cannabis shopping experience because you're intelligent enough about cannabis to know how to get what you want. Um, and so whether you're investigating a flower for its quality or the psychotropic direction, whether it's a stimulant or a sedative, um, the cannabinoids that are present are invisible to you. Visually, you can't smell them. You can't see them. You can't smell them. And so um, that's that's almost when you get back to the fun old school with uh, ganja, where before a, you know it had a COA, or or if you smoke the way I do, I haven't been in a dispensary in a long time. Or if I have. <laughs> Uh, I rarely buy flour because I live in Colorado. Um, California has much better flour. <laughs> and, and I think Oregon has some of the best in the country. Um, but, uh, but that's why I grow my own, right? And so uh, my, my, I harvest my plants when they're ready. And I smoke those and I preserve those flowers in, in really uh, good ways. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, but but it's not um, the old school way is, you know, smoking your herb and, and seeing if it's a, a heavy hitter or not. That's almost your and, and by that time, you should have a developed tolerance. If you're interpreting proficient, you know, your your herbs, you're not going to smoke a, 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 a an herb in and, and all of a sudden feel like you're on LSD. Um, you're you're going to be able to handle it and you'll be able to gauge its potency. But the cool thing is, if you are using interpreting in combination with the information provided at the dispensary, you should be able to see like, oh, okay, this flower is at 17% THC. And because I'm interpreting it, I'm gauging its, um, its potency due to its pungency, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I've got a cool video on one of our Spliff Busters episodes on YouTube where I clearly explain how one type of cannabis that has half as much THC in it can get you twice as high. Yeah. And it's because it has way more psychoactive chemistry in it because we're including all of the other terpenes, cannabinoids and flavonoids that most laboratories generally don't test for. And just because you have an herb that has way more THC in it doesn't mean that it has more psychoactive chemistry in it compared to a younger, fresher herb. Um, and so, you can really utilize a lab test and interpreting methodology together to gauge, okay, to, to know what the, the cannabinoids are, uh, the quality, the pungency, the potency, the psychotropic direction. Um, and that's usually how we do it when we do uh, cannabis cups. We usually put all of those pieces together <laughs> on, 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 each, on each sample. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I've gone and seen dispense new, um new strains, cultivars at dispensaries, and they'll be like 30% THC. And then I'll take that product home and I'll be like, that really wasn't anything special, you know? And a lot of, unfortunately right now, because of COVID, we don't really have the same opportunity that we did before to actually get up and close with the bud to like, you know, hold the jar in our hands to be able to smell it up to our nose where I would have been able to tell, well, there's like no smell there, you know, it's not really worth my money. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you that you have to put those two together just because it says high testing results doesn't mean that it's going to get you more high at I, all. I think it was the dope cup, Oregon, 2017, when my team picked the best flower of the whole state out of 250 flowers, um, and it was the, one of the highest scoring um, flowers we've ever rated on our tag system, Tricom Assurance Grading, the application we built that assists us in grading cannabis objectively. Um, and it, I mean, one of the highest scoring flowers we've ever seen, a flower that just shocked us from its, its 
and it's just beauty. I mean, the, we opened the jar and everybody in the, it was like a grenade. <laughs> went off. We're like, what the hell is that? Like this thing was just unbelievable. It's presence just filled the entire room kind of a thing. And uh, it had 14% THC. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, and like when we, when we explain that on stage, that's when like the industry industry is like, oh no, how could you pick an herb that has such little THC? And it's like, because the cannabinoid THC doesn't mean you did a good job growing the plant. You're talking about an individual molecule, bro. This is a cannabis competition. We're judging flowers. You wanna judge chemistry, go to a laboratory. Yeah. Get at it, like, what are you doing? Like this, that's just stoner talk. <laughs> it's like, um, you need an interpreting course. <laughs> it's like, if you think like THC is what's most important in flower, man, are you uh, smoking the wrong stuff? Cause yeah. uh, that 14% herb would have annihilated you over any <laughs> THC at 30%, more than double the, the flower if that 30% THC herb was dehydrated, if it wasn't properly taken care of, if it was old, all those things. Well, I'm really glad that you shared that story because that makes a really good point. Um, that's, it's very true. Um, so I know that in your course, you also teach about how the different terpenes, how you can actually sense them, like in the different uh, areas of your, like your nose and your navel. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> I, like my first answer in my head is like, no, <laughs> like, why would people take the course? <laughs> <laughs> well, just a little T, you know, cause I thought that was so okay. interesting. I'll, I don't want to explain I'll, it all. I'll do, a, I'll do a good job of teasing you. Okay? Yeah. All right. I'll tease you. So um, what's, what's really cool about our, our approach to the cannabis sommelier, right? Is your ability to do all the things that these labs should be doing in the first place, determining where on the spectrum of quality this flower is, we're talking about good weed, how good, where's the quality at? How do you measure that objectively, right? Um, okay. And, and then it's, how do you know if it's a stimulant or a sedative? And this is answering the cannabis industry's multi-billion dollar problem, mm -hmm. right? Because it's either an indica or a sativa. It's either one or the other when it's neither. It's, it's, it's not a gray wolf and it's not a coyote. <laughs> it's somewhere between a French bulldog and a golden retriever. It is not its ancient indigenous type that it was hybridized from uh, culturally and through millennia, <laughs> um, right? And so th this is what we're dealing with. If the cannabis industry could solve this problem, it would be a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, and interpreting is pretty proud that we do have the solution. We're just not that well known yet. Um, we also haven't told people that we've uh, actually had a terpene supercomputer verify if interpreting is bullshit or not. Um, they actually had me come out to California and tested me with eight jars of, of flour that all could not be more different from each other. Some two weeks old, some a year old, some was a new genetic that had never been put on the market yet. Some were old OG typicity type genetics, everything in between um, to test whether or not a human being could on their own with no other data points besides the flour in front of them determine if it is a stimulant or a sedative or mm -hmm. if it's slightly stimulating or slightly sedative or exactly in between the two. And so what we're talking about is five effect types of cannabis. The most stimulating, slightly stimulating, in between stimulating and sedative, slightly sedative, and the most sedative. That's your spectrum of effect types. Um, and that's, that's how the weed wheel works, right? So broadleaf marijuana, um, the physical feature of the herb, what you smell, where you smell it, and then how those effect types uh, should be oriented, and then the, the effect um, based on your personal tolerance as well. Um, and so broadleaf type, sedative, to slightly sedative, to what we would call hybrid, or in between, to slightly stimulating, or to uh, fully stimulating. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between stimulating and sedative from a cannabis perspective uh, is terpenes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And what I discovered um, around, <laughs> really around high school, it, it, it was interpreting that actually helped me get off pharmaceuticals. It was the ability to gauge which of these black market herbs I was getting. There was no such thing as a dispensary. How is this one? I'm going to save it because this one helps me with sleep. And I'm going to save this one that I bought from this guy because this one helps me pay attention in class with my ADD, right? Um, and so I really had to focus, hyper-focus, almost from an esoteric perspective on every minute detail. And I am a super taster. Um, <laughs> And I, I, and I have been talking with plants, animals, and extraterrestrials since I was three. So between all of these gifts and between the passion and all the weirdness and, and, and the science behind it that has been tested, uh, we just haven't published it yet. Um, what, we, what I learned is the vibrations that terpenes emanate um, can be registered in different parts of the face and you can actually feel the terpenes that are stimulating in a different part of your face that you can feel them as sedative. Um, and then when you're really honed in to your trigeminal nerve, which is your sensory sensation, it's your ability to sense sensation. Um, when you hone that in, you can get into those minute points. Like it's not a full stimulant, it's a slight stimulant because it's here, not there. Yeah. Um, and so it's the collective uh, vibrations that are more stimulating or more sedative that outweigh the two within any hybrid herb type that is detectable. You can pinpoint, you know, let's say that there's 100 terpenes in this one flower. If 70 of those terpenes are stimulants and 30 of them are sedatives, it's going to be a sativa dominant or NLMD, narrow leaf marijuana dominant type. And it's gonna be stimulating in effect, but not as stimulating as it could be. And you can see that within its inflorescence, but you can also smell its main terpene types, D-lemonine, apinine, terpenaline, and then you can register the totality of the rest of the terpene types and their collective vibration in different parts of the trigeminal nerve to really gauge what do we got here, right? Because your lab test won't tell you that. But I mean, with a, with a weed wheel and a jeweler's loop in a general education, you can actually figure this stuff out for yourself. Like that's the cool part about interpreting. It's like, it's fun. It's like, it's yeah. cool to do. Um, it's a really fascinating skill to have. You know, you'll be able to consume better cannabis products to, to deliver the kind of qualities that you want and the kind of relief that you want. And then think about how helpful you'll be to other people, you know, trying to go through the cannabis journey and imagine how fun you'll be at, at dinner parties. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, when you bring a weed wheel to a dinner party, it's <laughs> all over, or you just leave the interpreting loop on your coffee table. I've walked into doctor's offices, medical marijuana doctor's offices. Right. And it's, it's cool. They have these in like their counter to like teach their patients. They're like, so I'll give you a license and then you're going to go out into the industry and they're going to tell you that it's a sativa or an indica, but <laughs> really what, what we're doing here is, is more complex, uh, but let's break it down in really easy ways. And one of the easiest ways to break down indica and sativa is to stop telling people what's not true, right? That there's a possibility that this one's an indica and this one's a sativa out the window, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, well, what are they? What are they actually? And how, what could you call it that someone couldn't argue with? Well, it's a broadleaf type marijuana. Well, then people will argue with the word marijuana because they haven't seen our 30 minute YouTube with Professor Santiago Guerrera, who explains the 500 year etymology of indigenous people tricking the Spanish captors that marijuana is the plant of Mother Mary, since they were trying to make them Christian and take all their plants away from them anyways. They just said, listen, guys, the plants that you're forcing me to grow that you brought from Europe for your sails and for your ropes, for your ships and for your tents and your clothing, hemp that had THC in it that they also used as an entheogen religiously. They said, you can't take this one away from us. You can't take away everything. Therefore, we call this plant metaguana. <laughs> and metaguana, Santa Maria, marijuana. Marijuana means of Mother Mary. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, 
that's what marijuana means. <laughs> and that's why we should celebrate the word because uh, it was used to combat um, a prohibition against plant-based medicines. Um, and so it's a beautiful word when you understand it and when you use it in a positive way. And our words have meaning depending on the meaning that we give them. Um, and so uh, um, we love, so, so right, so <laughs> that within that aspect, sorry for the going off there, it, just trying to break down indica and sativa, it is a broadleaf marijuana type. And it's marijuana type because it's not a hemp type. And marijuana and hemp are the only two multi-billion dollar cannabis industries that are entirely separate from each other. Then there's cannabis outside of those things that aren't commercial. Curbishcanica, ruderalis, mm -hmm. uh, chinensis. Um, these, are, these are cannabis types that wouldn't fall into what we do <laughs> in our industry. And so to us, it just is so much easier to tell people the truth from a from a from a verbiage perspective. This is a narrow leaf marijuana type. It's an NLM. If it were a hemp type, it would be an NLH. And the, the difference between an NLH and an NLM has more to do with THC uh, than almost anything else, but there are some genetic differences between marijuana and hemp types, but I am not going there. <laughs> not right now. Well, that was a really good answer and that was really informative. <laughs> um, we have so many good questions on here. I mean, I've never seen so many questions in one presentation. So we have a really interested and engaged audience. So many good questions. Um, so I'm kind of, um, I'm picking one that I've never thought about before. It's a good question. Somebody's saying um, that they've heard that if you grow your plants in the colder conditions that they have the tendency to turn purple do the temperatures affect the terpene profiles? Not the terpene profiles, the um, flavonoids. Which are also very important. They don't, we don't really talk about flavonoids a lot. Turning purple is called anthocyan biosynthesis. <laughs> and what that is, is um, you really just have to think about the fall, right? You people in California don't have fall. You don't have seasons. Where I live, we have seasons. <laughs> there is snow on the ground right now. I had to break ice off of my windshield just to drive to get here <laughs> on my way over. Um, so just think about the fall. Um, the leaves turn colors. Why? Things are changing. What's going on? The plants are dedicating themselves to reproduction. It's sexy time. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's throwing seed down time. Um, and there's, uh, they need to focus their energy on their seeds um, and the shells of their seeds and other things. And so, and simultaneously, it's also getting cold. And so there's just this natural progression of color change that happens in that way. Um, and cannabis is really beautiful in the fall. Uh, here in Colorado in October, my ganjas are Rasta AF. They are green, yellow, and red. Um, <laughs> they're, they're awesome. At the end of the day, yes. Let's say you're growing indoors. Um, hopefully you're smart enough to not use your air conditioning, but to pull your intake ventilation through a HEPA filter from the cold air outside, if you live in Colorado. And hopefully you're also smart enough not to outtake ventilate your heat from your lamps out into the world, but recycle that heat up through your house by connecting it through your vents. Mm -hmm. Be careful, everything you own, including your pets, will smell like weed. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, I mean, we could go into anthocyan biosynthesis. At the end of the day, yes, if you have the genetics that are more Cush types, and Cush genetic is proper because there are genotypes and subspecies and varietals that come from Afghanistan. In fact, they are Afghanica. And so Indica subspecies Afghanica that um, spent a, a few millennia uh, in the Hindu Kush mountains where it snows and is at a very high elevation is why these plants evolved to have the, uh, the ability of anthocyan biosynthesis as much as they do. Mm -hmm. And so there are more Kush types and BLM varietals that are more Afghanistan in origin that 
are the plant types that um, can can be turned purple faster. Hmm. Um, they're they're just more genetically prone to do that. You are an incredible resource of information. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, so kind of like similar to that, is there a significant variation in terpenes between like indoor, outdoor, outdoor sun grown cannabis? This needs more testing, but let's be real. It's all about your wavelengths of light, the potency of those wavelengths and the spectrum they produce. Um, and scientists have got really good at mimicking the sun in LED lights. And some of the newer LED lights that are out there are so cool that you program your whole grow room on your cell phone. And so mm -hmm. it's the vegetative cycle, and then you flip the flower cycle, like, on a button on your phone instead of flipping rooms or light bulbs. I mean, welcome to the growing weed in the Jetson era, right? It's like, yeah. totally <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, uh, um, shoot, where was I just going? We were just asking if the terpene uh, profile is yeah. different, indoor, outdoor, sun-grown. Sun-grown cannabis, the thing is, is it doesn't look as sexy as indoor cannabis because the sun is harsh. And that harshness beats down on the chlorophyll. So your outdoor flowers sometimes are more, they're, they're less green and they're less, vib they don't have that vibrancy almost to them. Um, but that's a key sign for good weed, <laughs> if you know interpreting, because if you're interpreting the qualitative features of a flower that you obviously known was grown under the sun, and that's why it looks the way it does, it really should have a higher terpene profile. And it's because terpenes, terpenes, cannabinoids, and flavonoids, believe it or not, um, photosynthesize. Hmm. So it, the sun is what's actually growing them in combination with the water, the nutrients, and how they've been genetically programmed in the plant to begin with. Right. So what do you think? Do you think that we're better than uh, growing cannabis indoors, or do you think Mother Nature? You think Mother Nature does a good, better job? Oh well, growing I mean, cannabis. When we get into the how to grow cannabis the right way, uh, it's not even a conversation, it's a debate. Although to me, it's not a debate. <laughs> to the industry, it's a debate. To me, it's, there's, there's a, there, is, there is a method to grow cannabis the right way. Um, and the right way is regenerative farming, period. And you can add things to that. You can add things that are more biodynamic, like companion planting, agroforestry, sequestering carbon. Um, you can add all of those elements to what regenerative farming is and means. Um, but the idea, the idea of regenerative farming is a farmer helping mother nature do what she does best. She's really good at what she does. And when you have more of a Zen approach to growing your cannabis, which is do less, <laughs> not more, uh, better things happen. Leave your plants alone. Unless you wanna blow them kisses, tell them you love them, give them good vibes, that is helpful. We have research on that. But <laughs> so you can do that. But for the most part, throw your seeds in a gooey pile of warm horse shit and let them do their thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and like in a in a system uh, with some mycelium, if you can, and, and and this or that, and you know, if you're collecting um, the chicken shit from your farm over there, that's good stuff. You know, that that's nitrogen, and that's this, and that's that. And so, the the funny point to this is, when you see grows in Colorado that's been literally a half a million dollars a month on electricity alone just for the light bulbs to grow their cannabis when it's 85 degrees outside a mile high in Colorado. I mean, that is like a dagger through the heart for an environmentalist. But um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy that you'll, that you'll go to the grow store and buy nutrients that are 1%, 2%, 3%. You're spending 99.8% of your money on water in a plastic bottle that shipped from China. And like, uh, so you're just spending money on electricity, plumbing, HVAC, intake ventilation, outtake ventilation, this, that, and then all the problems you have to solve in between. The amount of money that it costs to try to grow good weed versus some of the dudes in the Emerald Triangles, 
in the Emerald Triangle who, I mean, they're just like in their little flip flops and just drinking coffee in the morning, smoking a spliff. And they're like in their, in their little rope and they don't pay a penny. They don't have plumbing. There's no HVAC. There's no, it's, it's just not this whole hullabaloo. And then at the end of the day, their weed rocks. It's like just this really good stuff. <laughs> it's, it's the best. Um, and so to me, there is, a, there is a, a, a right and a wrong, of course, with spectrums in between the two, but that's, that's, how, that's what good weed is. That's good. That's a really good question for us to end on the, uh, with. And then the last question I do want to ask you is like, I keep on getting a lot of questions asking about what's next with the Tricom Institute after the pandemic, are you going to have some sort of event where everybody that's taking your course can get together? What is next um, on the calendar for your, the Tricom Institute? Uh, some people who follow us closely know that we've privately been working on uh, publishing some new science on brand new glandular trichome types that we've discovered, which have been confirmed by uh, university scientists in the U.S. and North Korea, um, but kill, <laughs> the amount of side projects I have, it's like, it's not good. Um, we're also building an application which will allow you to do interpreting uh, through an app. So oh, cool. you scan your flower at your dispensary and all of the interpreting has already been done for you by like a level three certified interpreter. So uh, if you can't smell your weed, if you can't investigate it, if you can't gauge it, and you have to buy, uh, you know, flour that's been prepackaged. Um, if you trust us and you scan it, you can get full-blown reports on the qualitative features. We'll show you what your flour will look like microscopically, everything in between. That's that's what we do uh, when we build tag reports. So like that's coming up. Uh, we're developing an aromatic training kit uh, with terpenes, um, some of which are actually not even liquid. Some of the terpenes that we're using to train your trigeminal nerve are solid crystalline terpenes. They're actual crystals that we'll teach you with <laughs> that you can buy, um, so totally cool. wild. Um, and then we need to refilm our current interpreting course so that it's more consistent with how our other courses look and feel. It needs to be a little shorter in length and it needs to be a little more intimate. It needs to be a little bit more of a master class um, that also includes updates, uh, updated science. Uh, you know, we predicted the California Appalachian thing. Mm -hmm. I guess we would, didn't predict it. We, we knew when it was going to happen. And now that it's happened, we need to update things. So uh, we need to film new online courses that are uh, even better than what we currently have. Um, although all of the rest of the courses we have are just kick ass awesome. Um, and if you want to give that code away for 50% uh, yeah. off for uh, our extracts course and CCT and interpreting, I think it's Hey Max. Hello um, Max. Hello Max. Yeah, Hello Max. We'll hello, give you 50% off if you guys pay for a full price one of those three courses that was just mentioned. And I would definitely recommend it. Um, I got the book myself and the tools, and I think that I'm definitely going to sign up for the full course because this really has opened my eyes to a lot of things I didn't even know I didn't know. I've learned a lot today. I am so thankful for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I always appreciate the people in the cannabis industry that uh, enjoy sharing information with people. Um, and I can tell that from you, that you love educating people, you love guiding people in the right way. And this has definitely been one of my favorite webinars so far. I hope that you've enjoyed it being our guest speaker. I could see everybody chiming in has also um, enjoyed it. We've had people watching from all over the world. So very cool. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll let people know, um, you know, uh, Tricom Institute for Instagram, social media, LinkedIn, yes. Facebook. Um, uh, that's all the cannabis stuff, interpreting stuff, free videos uh, from time to time that we post. Um, our Spliff Busters uh, series on YouTube is a little show we do where we cover a lot of this misinformation in very quick and cheeky ways. Um, but also my personal social media, max.montrose, um, which has a lot of um, other uh, sacred plant medicine information, lots of psychoactive cacti types toads, vines, adventures throughout the world, all the stuff I'm not allowed to put on Tricom. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then the other, the other um, Instagram page is trichome.institute. If you've ever watched, wants to follow both of those, I would definitely recommend it. 
Um, thank you everybody for being with us today. Thank you definitely Max Montrose for being our speaker today. I hope that we were able to share some information with all of you that makes you better informed cannabis consumers. Have a great day, stay safe and see you soon. Thanks so much. <laughs>